The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. I felt completely unlovable. I needed to make a fresh start. We felt like there was no hope. But my story. My story. My story isn't over. And neither is yours. God can still do something extraordinary in your life. In my life. No matter who you are. What you did. Or what's happened before. You can begin again. It's never too late. You can begin again. Available now from Joyce Meyer Ministries or wherever books are sold. I'm doing a series called Beauty for Ashes. I wanted to do it again, and it was evidenced last night just by the reaction that I got when in teaching this that many people did not have an understanding that God is interested in healing your wounded emotions. We have to get over thinking that the only thing that God wants to do is keep us out of hell. He wants us to have a great life. And if your emotions are all messed up, if you have a lot of addictive behaviors because of wounds in your past, then you're not going to enjoy your life. And the, the other thing that is so important is very few other people are going to be impressed with your relationship with God enough to want one themselves. We need to be stable, mature, healed, whole individuals. Let me say it again. Stable, <laughs> mature healed, whole, vibrant individuals. And if we're living the life that Jesus died for us to have, truth is, we will not have to try to beat everybody over the head with our Bible. They're going to actually be wanting to know something's different about you. What? How can you be so happy? Wait, you mean you went through that as a child and now you're, how, how can that be? And that's what we need. That's our greatest witness is a healed and a complete life. So, as you know, well, maybe you don't know. There might be a few that don't know. Maybe some people that just turned on the television set for the first time today. I was sexually abused by my father for somewhere around 15 years, I think. Repeatedly, regularly. And it damaged my personality. Your personality is a, is a combination of your God-given temperament and the things that happen to you, usually in the early years of your life, but it doesn't always have to be those early years of your life. But much of our personality is formed in the first few years of our life. People need love. God has created us for acceptance, not rejection. He has created us for connection, not separation and abandonment. There is a, a God need in us, a need placed in us by God to have love, unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. When people don't get that or when they're used for a purpose other than what they should be used for, a lot of bad things begin to happen. Most of us go through hurts in our life and then all of a sudden we're adults and we've got all these layers of mess in our soul and we try to find some way to function in society through pretending or wearing masks or just hiding from things. The truth be told, many, many people are miserable behind their frozen smile and they're really failing at relationships. We have to know who we are in Christ. Otherwise, what we end up doing is we put a tremendous burden on everybody that we're in relationship with to make us feel good about ourselves. Now, I want you to hear this. If you don't love yourself, and if you don't know that God loves you, and when I say love yourself, I'm not talking about being selfish and self-centered. I'm talking about you get along with yourself. You're not always in a constant war about you. Well, I'm not this. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Well, we're all not something, but we are something too. We need to learn to look at the more positive side of it.
But if you don't have that confirmation in you that you're loved and that you're okay, you may not be perfect, but you're okay, you're growing, you're on your way, then you're always gonna look to other people to make you feel good about yourself. And nothing destroys a relationship faster than that because the other person feels manipulated and controlled and pressured all the time to keep that insecure person propped up. And I'm gonna take you through a, a trickle-down theory of what happens if you know that God loves you, but you think he loves you based on conditions that you must fulfill, and all the mess that causes in your life. And then I'm gonna take you through what happens if you know that God loves you unconditionally, if that's the root and the foundation of who you are. I know that God loves me unconditionally and how that changes every single thing after that. Today is gonna to be a little bit clinical. It's gonna be like you have gone to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and you walked in and said, I am really messed up. <laughs> and some of you might think, well, that's not for me because I've got it all together. Well, okay, I'm happy for you. <laughs> but let me tell you, even if you do, you probably are around some people that are messed up. And so we'll just say by some stretch of the imagination that you've got it all together you still need to understand those other messed up people in the world. I could probably say when Dave and I got married that I was pretty messed up and he was pretty together. Dave had a great foundation in the word of God. His dad was an alcoholic and actually died from drinking, so he really didn't have a present father in the home. But his mom was a godly woman who made sure they went to church and taught them the principles of God and lived those principles out in front of him and... So that's encouragement for those of you who maybe there's only one parent who seems to have any brains in the home. You can overcome the bad effect that somebody else is having through prayer and through being a great witness and an example and through teaching your children the Word of God. The Word of God will always prevail over messes if it's taught properly and lived out in the home. Come on now. So you don't have to live in fear and think, well, you know, my kids are gonna be a mess because he or because she or whatever. You just keep doing what's right and trust God that there's power in his word and in his principles to overcome whatever the mess might be. But Dave had a great experience with God at an early age. He was born again when he was a young boy, received the fullness of the Holy Spirit in his life when he was about 18 and really studied the word, and so he came into our relationship ready for me. <laughs> you, you may have heard me tell this, but you know, Dave and I only had five dates and got married. I don't probably recommend that, but <laughs> um, the first night he saw me, I was washing my mother's car and he tried to flirt with me, which I didn't like men, didn't trust men, and had a very snotty, sarcastic attitude. And uh, the reason why I didn't like him was because I'd been hurt by every man that I ever got around, used and abused and, and hurt, taken advantage of. And so when he said, hey, hey. <laughs> if you remember back in the days, I had this big beehive, you know, <laughs> had on my little short shorts and I was out there washing the car. And, hey, when you get finished washing that car, do you wanna wash mine? I turned around and I said, if you want your car washed, wash it yourself. And he said, I'm telling you the absolute truth, he said the thing that went off in my heart was that's the girl for me. <laughs> so he either really wanted a big challenge, wasn't too smart, or was being led by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so we had five dates and he asked me to marry him and I always like to say it's probably a good thing he did because if he would have hung around me too long, he would have gotten afraid because <laughs> I really just was messed up. My personality was all messed up. But in Isaiah chapter 61, as I began to study the Word of God diligently, and that didn't happen for many years because I was in a large religious denomination that had a great foundation about salvation, but I never, I never learned much 
about how to live my daily life or how to, well, I did learn some things about how to live my daily life, but not much about how to overcome my past. And uh, when I became a real student of the Word of God, and you know, there's a big difference in going to church on Sunday and studying the Word of God. How many of you know that there's a big difference in that? There's a big difference in you turning on my TV program every day and hearing that and you studying the Word of God. So I'll just tell you, and as much as I want you to watch my program, if you don't have time for me and God, then put Him first. <laughs> Amen? Because there's nothing that is more valuable to you than your personal time with God. I think it's good to watch somebody like me get that word, take some notes, and then look those scriptures up, study it for yourself, take some time at lunch or whatever, and meditate on what you've learned. Don't just wait for somebody else to download everything into you. Be a serious student of the Word of God. Well, when I began to really study the Word, I started finding out how really messed up I was. The Bible says that the Word is like a mirror. And you look into it, and you know, you can have dirt on your face and not know it at all, but if you go look in a the mirror, then you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've been, you know, walking around with that all day. Well, see, the Word of God is so valuable because we look in it like a mirror, and through that, we, we begin to see the promises of God, but we also begin to see not only what's available to us, but what's wrong with us, and that's healthy. Because you can never get to where you need to be if you don't face where you're at. Somebody please listen to me today. Stop blaming everything on somebody else and ask God to show you, you. Amen? We get so fixated on what everybody else is doing wrong. Well, you're doing this and you're doing that. You can't change them. You cannot change other people. Only God can change other people. But what you can do is let God do what he wants to do and you pray for them and you can see a lot of change in your life, a lot of good change. Well, one of the things that I had was a lot of addictive behaviors and you say, well, what's an addictive behavior? Well, it's a habit that's gone wild. It's like, um, it's something that you can't do without. Now, I wasn't addicted to drugs, I wasn't addicted to alcohol, but I had other personality addictions. I had to control everything or I couldn't be happy. I'm sure none of you have that problem. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here is just sweet and submissive and you don't have a rebellious bone in your body, but I was rebellious. You did not want to tell me to do something I didn't want to do. And I was like that because my father had controlled me and manipulated me. And somewhere in that process, I made a pact with myself. <laughs> when I get out of here, nobody is ever going to tell me what to do again. Anybody been there, done that? Let's see a few hands. All right. That's a whole lot of folks. We got the right crowd today with the right message. Well, once you've made those promises to yourself and made those agreements with yourself, and then you begin to look into the mirror of God's Word and you say, oh, submission. Oh. <laughs> Let other people have their way. <laughs> oh, yuck. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Even if you're willing to do it, you may not be able to do it if you're addicted to that kind of of behavior. So there's a lot of addictions besides just substance abuse addictions. And so I'm going to go through a lot of different things with you today. Hopefully there's going to be one or two that you're going to hit on and say, oh man, I have a problem with that. But the Bible teaches us that God will give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that he will make us trees of righteousness. The plant